Criminals sometimes like to taunt authorities and their victims' families, so there's nothing typical within the following true crime stories. Whoever's behind them is not only clever, but also left behind perplexing clues that even today remain unsolved. These are five unsolved crimes with strange clues. Number five, Glico Morinaga case, monster with 21 faces. On March 18, 1984, two armed masked men broke into Katsuhisa Zazaki's home in Japan. Once inside, they bound his wife and daughter. Azaki was hiding with his two other children inside the bathroom, and that's when they kidnapped him. Azaki was a CEO of Glico, a company that made candy and ice cream. The next day, the captors called the director of Glico and demanded 1 billion yen and 100 kilograms in gold bullion. The company managed to buy some time, and luckily for them, Azaki actually managed to escape from his captors just three days later on March 21st. The company thought it had dodged a huge extortion case, but things were only just getting underway. By April 10th, several vehicles within the parking lot of Glicko's headquarters were burned. Six days later, they found plastic containing hydrochloric acid along with a threatening letter. The following month, on May 10th, the company began receiving letters from a person or group who called themselves the Man with 21 Faces. The threats were very serious and they said that they had laced Glicko's candies with potassium cyanide soda. As a result, Glicko pulled their stock of candy from stores causing a $21 million loss and hundreds of layoffs. The Man with 21 Faces then began sending letters not just to Glicko, but to the police as well as the media. They soon turned their extortion campaign against other companies as well, including Morinaga, Marudai Ham, and House Foods Corporation. For Marudai Ham, they ordered that one of their employees deliver the money by throwing the bag along a train route from Kyoto. A police officer disguised himself as an employee and got on the train. He noticed a man he described as fox-eyed, with a muscular build acting suspiciously, who he tailed but eventually lost. In the instance of House Food Corporation, police discovered a stolen white station wagon used by the criminal or criminals for the money drop-off. Inside was radio equipment set to police frequencies, as well as logs that tracked communications by police in the area. With pressure on the authorities and no arrests made, the police superintendent actually committed suicide by setting himself on fire. He was ashamed of his failure to capture the perpetrators and in response, the man with 21 faces acknowledged his sacrifice and offered their condolences. They also withdrew from the public eye soon after that and were never heard from again. The monster with 21 faces is enigmatic mostly because of the letters they issued out to the public. They taunted police, even offered clues as to their identity and where they could be found. The food industry in Japan lost millions of dollars as a result of them, but as abruptly as they showed up, they also just seemingly disappeared. Towards the end, they even proclaimed they were just getting tired of the game. To this day, no one has ever been arrested in relation to these crimes. Number 4. Mary Shotwell Little Known as Atlanta's Missing Bride, on October 14, 1965, after work, 25-year-old Mary Little went to dinner with a co-worker and happily talked about her married life. By 8 p.m., she was headed back to her car, but she was never heard from ever again. When police investigated her disappearance, they found clues inside her vehicle. Her Mercury Comet was found in Lenox Square and was covered in red dust as if it had been driven down a dirt road. Inside were grocery bags, Coke bottles, a pack of Kent's and women's undergarments including a slip, underwear, bra, girdle, and a single stocking neatly folded sitting on the console. The stocking, however, looked like they had been cut by a knife, and there were blood smears all along the interior. The car engine was cold, and no keys were inside. A massive search for Mary occurred over the next five days, and every police officer available was put on the case. The blood stains were found to be Mary's blood type, some friends told investigators that 
Mary had been afraid of being home alone in the days just prior to her disappearance. She had received flowers from a secret admirer, as well as several unusual phone calls at work. However, Mary never told friends or family any further details. Police soon received word that a gas station attendant from Charlotte, North Carolina, where Mary was originally from, had a receipt with Mary's signature. The attendant said he recalled attending to a car with a man and a woman inside. The woman was lying in the front seat with a road map over her face, and she appeared to have a head injury and blood on her clothes. The attendant gave the credit card to the man, and then he gave it to the woman where she signed Mrs. Roy H. Little. She was also reportedly seen by another attendant, this time with two men in the car. One tantalizing clue about the case was found in November of 1965, when a boy in DeKalb County, Georgia found a scribbled note at the bottom portion of a deposit pouch addressed to the same bank Mary worked for. The scribbled note read, Help, Mary Little being held captive. The note was analyzed by the FBI and said it looked promising and could have been written by Mary herself, but despite this, no other leads would help investigators find out what happened to Mary Little. Incidentally, another young woman named Diane Shields worked in the same bank Mary had. Diane even held Mary's job briefly, but eerily in May of 1967 she was found murdered, her body stuffed inside her Chevrolet Impala's trunk. Police speculated Mary's disappearance and Diane's death were related, but ultimately that was later dismissed. The odd thing is that Diane was noted as telling her sister she was working with the police to investigate the death of a girl named Mary. However, her family has since refused to comment about the investigation, and even Mary's own mother refused to cooperate after Diane's death happened. Today, Diane's case still remains unsolved, just like that of Mary Little. Number 3. Annette Sagers It was October 4, 1988 in Mount Holly, South Carolina. 11-year-old Annette Sagers was on her way to school, standing at the bus stop in front of the Mount Holly plantation at 7 a.m. Her dog was standing beside her as they waited for the school bus bound for the Westview Middle School. 20 minutes later, the bus arrived at the stop, but no one was there. Later in the afternoon, when Annette didn't arrive home, her stepfather Stefan called the school and found out Annette never arrived there in the first place. He rushed to the bus stop only to find a mysterious note that said, Dad, Mama came back. Give the boys a hug. The boys being referred to were her two younger stepbrothers, Thomas and James. You see, Annette's disappearance and her mysterious note wasn't the only thing baffling about the case. A year before, Annette's mom, Corinna, left home to go out for a drive. The family lived at Mount Holly Plantation, where Stefan, Annette's stepfather, was a caretaker. After Corinna and Stefan got into an argument on November 21st of 1987, Corinna told them she was going out for a drive to calm down. She left sometime between 11 and 11.30 p.m. And the following day, when she didn't show up for work, her boss looked for her and found her abandoned car just outside the plantation, close to where Annette had disappeared a year later. It was hard for Karina's family and friends to believe that she would run off and leave behind her children, and they always suspected that something much more sinister was happening. Experts who studied the mysterious note left behind at the bus stop concluded that it was written by 11-year-old Annette, although it seems it was done under duress. Despite investigations, no leads were ever found regarding the whereabouts of Annette or her mother. Stefan relinquished his rights to his two sons, Thomas and James, soon after Annette disappeared. He then moved to Florida, remarried and had several children, while his two sons bounced around from one foster home to another. He started a completely new life because either the loss of his wife and stepdaughter was so great that he just had to do it, even at the cost of giving his two sons away, or because a new life was what he wanted all along. Today, the brothers still hope to find out what happened to their sister and mother. Karina was only 26 years old when she disappeared. Number 2. Zach Ramsey 
In Great Falls, Montana, it was another ordinary day for 10-year-old Zach Ramsey. On February 6, 1996, at 7.30 a.m., he left his apartment, and with only six blocks between him and the school, he took a route through an alley. However, Zach would never make it to school that day. After an initial search, his mother called police and they went door to door interviewing friends and neighbors in order to retrace Zach's steps. More officers were mobilized and a massive search effort was conducted. A neighbor informed police that he saw a small, off-white vehicle driven by a man parked inside the alley nearby. Several others said they saw Zach around 7.30 walk into that alley, leaving no doubt on the route he took. The case expanded and the search continued, but no trace of Zach was ever found. Police honed in on several suspects and at least one detective, 18-year veteran Bill Belushi, had a gut feeling the person responsible was a man named Nathaniel Barjona. Barjona was born David Paul Brown. He was known to the detective when he investigated the sexual assault of an 8-year-old boy. Apparently, Barjona was babysitting the boy while his parents were away for the evening. He denied the assault and commented to the officer that if he did commit the act, he would have killed the boy instead, and this comment embedded itself in the officer's mind. Despite an extensive history of pedophilia and assault in Massachusetts, where he was from, Barjona wasn't listed as a sex offender in Montana. He had assaulted young children since he was just seven years old. He proceeded to commit more abductions, including one in September of 1977, when he kidnapped two boys. He was sentenced to prison for the crime, but transferred to a psychiatric facility. Just a month after his release, he attempted to suffocate a young boy he saw sitting alone in a car while his mom was inside the post office. Oddly, he was given just two years probation under a plea deal on the condition he moved to Montana to live with his mother and to never return to Massachusetts. Since Zach's disappearance, police officer Belushi tried to find evidence linking Barjona to Zach. Although there was circumstantial evidence, he couldn't obtain a warrant to search his home. For three years, Barjona roamed free until he was seen by a veteran officer suspiciously scouting a school for several days. Patrol officers confronted him, and Barjona was wearing a dark blue jacket with a knit hat like those of a police officer. He also had a toy gun, pepper spray, and badge on him as well. As a result, he was charged with impersonating an officer, and an arrest warrant was issued for the said items. Afterward, Belushi was finally granted a warrant to search his property, and it was here that he found undeveloped film containing nude and undressed images of Barjona with three young boys. There were a list of victims, half of which were boys he grew up with. It also included Zachary Ramsey, and thousands of pictures of children. Perhaps the most unsettling were encrypted letters or recipes describing how to cook human meat. Detectives believe Barjona butchered some of his victims and cooked them, even serving it to friends and neighbors. They also found human bones in his garage, although this did not match Zach's DNA. Moreover, a meat grinder that had hair inside it was found inside his residence as well. In the end, Barjona was arrested for his crimes, especially when testimony of the children he had assaulted were given. As for the case of Zach, there was no concrete evidence linking his disappearance to Barjona, even though many believe he did it. Barjona was sentenced to 130 years in prison, and he later died on April 14, 2008 in his jail cell of cardiac arrest due to his obesity. Number 1. The Zodiac Killer The Zodiac Killer is an infamous serial murderer that hunted in Northern California during the 60s and early 70s. He's linked to five murders spanning from 1968 to 69, but may have injured and killed many more. The first known victims linked to the Zodiac were Betty Lou Jensen and David Faraday. On their first date, they drove out to Lake Herman Road, a well-known lover's lane at around 10.15 p.m. on December 20th, 1968. A little after 11 p.m., their bodies were found by a nearby resident. Police studied the scene and believe a second car followed and parked right next to the couple. The killer got out, 
approached the other vehicle and may have even ordered the couple to get out. When Faraday was halfway out, he was immediately shot. Jensen ran away before she too was gunned down and killed. Six months later, on July 4, 1969, the Zodiac killed another couple using the same M.O. This time, however, a man called the Vallejo Police Department informing them about the crime and taking responsibility for it. The following month, on August 1st, the Zodiac sent three letters to three newspapers, the San Francisco Examiner, Vallejo Times Herald, and the San Francisco Chronicle. All three were nearly the same, and the sender claimed responsibility for the past two killings. All three letters worked as a whole, containing one-third of a 408-character cryptogram. The killer said if it was solved, it would contain his identity. He also threatened that if it wasn't published on the front page of all three papers, he would go on a killing spree until he ended up with 12 victims, so all three letters were published. By August 7th, another letter was sent to the San Francisco Examiner, and it started with, Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. It was the first time the killer had proclaimed himself as the Zodiac. In the letter, the killer provided information including those that were only known by the police and not the public. He added that if the code were cracked, they would have me. The following day, Donald and Betty Harden from Salinas, California cracked a portion of the 408-character cryptogram that had been published. It mentioned how the Zodiac was collecting slaves for the afterlife and said he would not reveal his name because it would slow down or stop his collection. Several more killings occurred, including those in the Lake Berryessa attack and Presidio Heights in September and October of 1969, respectfully. By October 14th of 69, the Zodiac reached out to the papers again. The letter contained evidence taken from a recent killing, that of Paul Stein, while including a threat about killing school children. The following month, he sent another letter containing a 304-character cryptogram, but to this day, this has never been decoded despite multiple attempts. The next letter with a cipher arrived on April 20th, 1970, this had a 13-symbol cipher and a diagram for a bomb which would be rigged to kill school children on a bus. Communications from the Zodiac continued throughout the 70s. The killer sent multiple postcards and letters and even one more letter containing a cryptogram. However, as prolific as he was with his taunting of the public and law enforcement, the letters abruptly stopped in 1974. There were additional letters and postcards sent in the name of the Zodiac after that, however these later letters have never been fully verified as belonging to the killer. To this day, the identity of the Zodiac along with the cryptic letters has never been solved, and so he continues to remain one of the most elusive serial killers to ever exist. So those were five unsolved crimes with strange clues. These crimes are as baffling as the clues left behind by the perpetrators. Perhaps in time we'll find out what they mean, but most likely they'll remain a mystery forever. If you enjoyed this video, then please subscribe to our channel because we have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday we know you'll love. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next week.